here we're looking at cell respiration and this question is really focused on the electrochemical gradient and how that can break down and the way that impacts things. So for part A, well, I guess the setup here is that we have uh, this molecule, the MP, which ended up being used as a weight loss drug. Um, and we're exploring how this works at the cellular level. Okay, so what we know is that it loses a proton, a positive ion. Um, And so part A says, what can we predict the effect of DMP being on the gradient? Okay, so the question is, what does, really is what does an extra positive ion do to the gradient? And to be specific, the DMP sort of loses this ion um, on one side of the matrix, right? So if we have our inner mitochondrial membrane here, and we end up with this DMP causes this hydrogen ion to be lost to the outside of it. Okay, so then what was going to happen due to the electrochemical gradient, this ion gets to just flow back in freely. Okay, so this is going to collapse uh, the gradient. And cause their um, it makes it so that no energy that drives ATP synthesis will be able to be stored across the membrane. Okay, so what does this extra hydrogen ion do? It just completely destroys the whole gradient, which leads us into part B, and this is a, one of those longer multi-part questions, but part B asks us uh, to explain how it can be used to lose weight. So. Okay, we destroy the gradient, but what does that have to do with losing weight? Which is a fair question and super unclear just from what's happening at the cellular level. Uh, so once that gradient has been collapsed or diminished, cells are going to continue to oxidize food molecules to feed the electrons, high energy electrons into the electron transport chain. So we still want to put the electrons into the electron transport chain, which requires energy. Uh, but we have these hydrogen ions moving back into uh, the mitochondria and this like futile cycle of being pumped out and then back in and then out and then back in and out and back in. Um, and as a result, the energy of the electrons can't can't really be harnessed the same way. Uh, 
or utilized um, to drive ATP synthesis. Right, so we just have this hydrogen ion being pumped out, then back in and out and in and out and in and out and in. Um, and so instead, this gets released as heat. And um, and then our the fat reserves end up being utilized to drive the ATP synthesis instead. I guess it'd be more appropriate to draw the arrow um, there. Uh, But the fat reserves uh, feed the electron transport chain, which then um, drives ATP synthesis. OK, so then we can move on to part C. And part C says that the effects of DMP can be reversed. If we add glucose, okay, so let's remind ourselves what happens during glycolysis, right? We get some glucose and from that we end up with I believe three and I should have to check that but I believe it's going to be We have um, two three carbon molecules of pyruvate plus two molecules of ATP plus two molecules of NADH. And it does produce four molecules of ATP, but um, since it uses two of them, the net is two molecules of ATP. And so this whole thing is. the process of glycolysis. So what we're told is if we add the glucose and it gets to go through this whole process, then it reverses the effects. But if we add this uh, two deoxyglucose, which inhibits glycolysis from happening, and since we're inhibiting, let's do red, then there will be no reversal. So this is the setup, and the question becomes, why? OK, well, if we recall, the DMP from above is basically stopping us from storing ATP, which means that we are producing a lot of heat instead of energy in the traditional way. So if we are adding glucose, OK, so if we're adding, if we're adding glucose, what's happening is what we're doing is we're creating more glycolysis is going to happen. and more ATP is going to occur, okay, just by a product of that. And so having that ATP present um, means that we don't need 
to be dealing with pulling from the fat to get it out. So that process will chill, essentially. It'll, it won't happen. Um, but if we do indeed add the uh, to deoxyglucose, which inhibits glycolysis, then we don't get the ATP and the effects of the DMP will uh, continue to exist. Okay, so this moves us on to a, the final part of this question, which talks about the obesity epidemic, right? So obesity can lead to um, other health related issues. It's not always the case that folks who are obese are unhealthy, but um, it can lead to other problems such as elevated blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. Um, and so the idea is that if we had DNP, but kind of um, just a little bit. Okay, so it's not this extreme thing that's gonna just cause you to have, you know, burn off all your fat in this epic fever, but instead have the slow release technology over time. Um, would that be useful? And if it would be useful, is it still useful, right? So the idea is, um, if we were able, able to use this for a healthy amount of weight loss, do we want to do that? Uh, the thought that is given to us, the question provided to us here is, essentially, does losing weight with a pill Uh, cause people to not actually change their habits. So if someone is indeed unhealthy, it's possible that they're eating lots of, say, fast food and junk food. And if eating more vegetables were going to help them to lose weight, that would be a healthier lifestyle. But if they can continue to eat high fat content and lose weight, then won't they just eat the high fat content and therefore not actually become healthier? Right, because weight doesn't guarantee being healthier. Uh, and if people aren't changing their behavior, then are we really doing anything about the obesity epidemic? So we want to refine this question uh, into something that could be tested scientifically. And then justifying the merits. And so there's really... Um, I would argue there's not a correct answer to this part of the question. Uh, it's just a thought process of maybe you think to yourself something along these lines. How do you ask it in a scientific way? So one thing that makes it a scientific question is testability. So uh, this slow release of DMP, is also a CRMP, right? So we could say uh, does 
the administration of CRMP result in additional lifestyle changes. And so this is pretty vague. What is a lifestyle change? You would need to define that. And perhaps you actually just want to be more specific since we're being scientific, perhaps instead of lifestyle changes, we want to say in uh, dietary changes or in increased exercise, right? And you can even um, list all of those things and the more specific you are, the more measurable it'll be, and um, the more measurable you'll be it, that it is, the more you know scientifically uh, rigorous it is if you can measure it. Um, and perhaps you're just interested in one small facet, so instead of what it, does it mean to be healthier in a holistic way? A particular study would be more likely to ask just one very specific question. So I might be more inclined to say something like, does the administration of CM CRMP um, result in perhaps continued weight loss after um, some number of years, right? So do they just lose weight while they take it and then gain it back, or does it stay off? And if it stayed off, that might be indicative of a lifestyle change. Um, but like I said, there's really no correct answer here. And the more specific you are, the more scientifically rigorous you are, but also, the less information you're probably getting holistically. So there's really this trade-off when you def make these questions. And that's, uh, I think, what that trade-off you choose is what you need to justify with the last part of D.